you take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 1. Verses 18 through 25. Matthew says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. And Joseph awoke from his sleep, and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Let's pray as we begin here. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit be our teacher and communicate to us, Lord, in this familiar passage that we hear. Let us see, as, the word, as your word says, Lord, let us see the word as it pierces and teaches us. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. So we pray that you be our teacher this morning. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Ashley and John McClinton have an amazing story regarding the birth of their son. He was the smallest surviving baby ever delivered at Methodist Women's Hospital in Omaha, Nebraska. The baby John was born at only 24 weeks. After complications in the pregnancy, the doctors decided to induce delivery. And when baby John was born, he weighed less than one pound. He spent over a hundred days in the hospital. But today, baby John is doing just fine. And the McClintons call him their miracle baby. And it's a wonderful story, and we're glad everyone is doing well. But our passage this morning describes a miracle baby. The birth of a baby that is completely unlike any other baby that has ever existed. And in this text, Matthew records the entrance of Jesus Messiah into our world. And it is nothing short of miraculous and supernatural. And it almost has to be, doesn't it? I mean, the promised Messiah, spoken of thousands of years before He would come through the sovereignty of God over countless circumstances, arranging it to happen exactly as God had foreordained. It it should be something extraordinary, and it certainly is. We are probably most familiar with this passage at Christmas time, right? And it's definitely known for that, but of course that is not the original idea of the passage. Matthew is not writing some fictional account that he says, well, this will play really well at Christmas time. It's good to look at this passage outside of the Christmas context. Because he's writing to tell us of the circumstances of how the Messiah arrived into this world. Now, last time we saw in verses 1 through 17 his, his genealogy, and we learned of his, his kingly ancestry. The sovereignty of God arranging all things in all of history for his coming to be in the royal line of David. 
And now in this passage, Matthew tells us how his birth actually came about. How he arrived and entered our world. The circumstances surrounding it, and they are nothing short of spectacular, or as we'll say, supernatural. The difference is rather jarring because Matthew gives us the natural genealogy in verses 1 through 17. All natural circumstances. So-and-so gave birth to so-and-so. So-and-so gave birth to so-and-so. It's just how things work. And the birth narrative is completely different. The birth narrative is supernatural. The birth narrative is divine. It is extraordinary. And so you see his his earthly lineage before, and then now Matthew tells us his divine lineage. And in this passage, we see four supernatural elements in Jesus' birth that show us that he is truly unique and truly unequaled. There is no one like him. He is both God and man, and having that accurate understanding of Christ and accurate Christology is crucial and critical to all of Christianity and why this Jesus this Messiah should be turned to in faith because he is the sinless Savior as this text teaches us let's look at these together four supernatural elements in Jesus's birth and number one is supernatural conception supernatural conception Matthew introduces us in verse 18, now the birth of Jesus the Messiah was as follows. And he'll get to that, but what he does first is tell us kind of how we get there, what happened before the birth, the the circumstances regarding the conception of this Jesus. And again, it is something that is supernatural. Now, I won't get into a conversation of the birds and the bees to understand how a baby is conceived in the womb of a woman, I will assume that you know that. And so we'll move on to see that it didn't happen in the natural way. Look at what the text says. It says, His mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, the couple that was mentioned back in verse 16, Joseph, the husband of Mary, Mary, the one by whom Jesus was born. Mary is the mother of Jesus. Joseph is her Husband, but at this time they are still engaged, they are betrothed. And in this culture, it was much more serious than our modern day understanding of engagement. Today, a couple who is engaged can easily break it off with no serious repercussions. It's almost like it's not finalized right until we walk down that aisle. But that was not the case in the first century. Most likely, Joseph and Mary were young, very young. Mary probably 12 or 13. Joseph a few years older than that. The families had probably arranged the marriage. And most likely, in regards to the context at this time, they probably weren't even consulted about it. Joseph and Mary... A contract was made between the two families. A dowry was paid by the groom's father to the brides. And after that agreement was made, the betrothal was binding. They would have a marriage ceremony later. Sometimes it could be up to a year later. As the groom had to get his house in order to be ready and to provide for a bride. And after that ceremony was when they would consummate the marriage. But that betrothal agreement was binding. It was serious. They were considered legally married. Notice verse 19. It says, Joseph, her husband. Notice that. This is before they were married. But he is already called her husband. That's how serious the engagement is. To separate would require a formal divorce. But as it says in verse 18, Mary is found to be with child. And it says specifically, before they had come together. That is to say, before 
the sexual union that happens after marriage. Before that took place, she is pregnant. And this is meant to be surprising because it speaks to the high standard that God places on sexual purity and that God defines sexual contact outside of marriage as sin. That's what he calls it. That is not an age-old church rule. That is a scriptural rule. The Bible calls it fornication, and the Bible says in Hebrews 13, the marriage bed is to be undefiled. Fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. That's Hebrews 13, 4. Even sexual contact in engagement is seen as sin. And so, Joseph and Mary's purity is highlighted here because they had not come together. But it is so scandalous that she is found to be with child before that. They were still engaged and she was pregnant. And it, was, it says it was found out. And then the idea is that, that the pregnancy became obvious. There was no way of hiding it. But we read that Mary's purity is legitimate and is right because it says at the end of verse 18, she was with child by the Holy Spirit. This is that supernatural occurrence. There's no other explanation for this other than this is a miraculous work of God. A supernatural occurrence by specifically God the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that did this. Somehow. And the Bible doesn't explain it. We are to chalk it up to supernatural work. Somehow, he, the Holy Spirit, caused Mary to be carrying in her womb the Son of God. And that is just as Mary was told in the Gospel of Luke. The angel Gabriel came to her and told her that's what was going to happen. And the Holy Spirit is therefore shown to be God and to be just as powerful and a miracle worker as God the Father or the Son. There are some unique children in Scripture. There is, of course, Isaac, who was born to Abraham when Abraham was close to 100 years old. There is the Lord intervening and opening the womb of, of Hannah when she couldn't have children so that she could have Samuel, but there is nothing like this baby, this supernatural conception. This is a mystery to us, but it is significant and it is important because it alone can explain how Jesus is at the same time both God and man. And we'll talk about that a little later. So we have supernatural conception. Secondly, we have supernatural communication. Supernatural communication. And Joseph is highlighted a lot in this text. And you have to put yourself in Joseph's shoes for a minute. You've been betrothed to this lovely girl. Dowries have been paid. The agreement has been made. The contract signed. A young lady, righteous and pure. She loves the Lord. And she comes to you and tells you that she is pregnant. What's going through his mind? In his mind, she has cheated. She has broken the marital covenant. Her, her purity is a lie. Her faithfulness is gone. She, she is an unfit wife. That's what Joseph would be thinking. And it tells us in verse 19, Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. He was a righteous man. He was a God-fearing man as well. And he's righteous really in two ways. And the first way he's righteous is that he shows grace. It says in verse 19, he did not want to disgrace her. And I just think of this question. Why? Why would he restrain? He could have brought this up publicly. This would have a common practice. He could have shown everyone her shame. 
In the Old Testament, friends, this is so serious. In the Old Testament, this was a capital crime. The punishment for Mary would be public stoning. And Jews would, would have wanted to do that, but because of the ruling Romans, the Romans didn't let them conduct uh, capital crimes like that, capital punishment. They didn't let them execute people. But it was still, that was the punishment for it. If he wanted to, he could have made this a big deal, right? He could have put her on blast in front of everybody. Let me expose her unfaithfulness because he's been shamed too, right? He's been embarrassed. His family. But his kindness and grace is put on display because instead of that it says he planned to send her away secretly. To send her away is another way of saying he would divorce her. He would divorce her. But instead of making it public and for all to see and telling everyone what happened, this would be private. It was allowed to be done in front of two or three witnesses. She would be sent away secretly. She would still leave in shame, but it would preserve her honor in some way. That she wouldn't be a public spectacle before everyone. Joseph is amazing, actually. We, we never hear of him being concerned for his own reputation. All he cares about is her. What will happen to her? He's a man of grace. And while he has developed this plan, it tells us in verse 20, when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying. This is another supernatural occurrence. Friends, angels don't make regular appearances. They don't. In this significant moment in history, the birth of the Messiah, they do. There are angelic visitations. Remember, Mary had one. The angel Gabriel came and told her that she would be pregnant. She would bear the Son of God while still a virgin. And she believed and submitted an amazing act of faith in regards to that. Remember the angels and the birth out in the fields at the shepherds. And Joseph here gets his own private visitation. The angel is sent with divine instruction, divine communication, supernatural communication. Look at what he says. Joseph, son of David. Again, Matthew's emphasis highlighting Jesus' kingly lineage. Son of David, take her as your wife. Because the child who is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. This is an astounding statement. This is a once-in-history moment and announcement. This is a divine work of God, Joseph. And this is heavenly testimony to the virgin birth right here. Joseph, you need to get past all of your fears, all of your hesitations, all of your reservations. Don't be afraid of the shame and the stigma you might face. Take her as your wife. In reality, Joseph is told to adopt Jesus. He's not going to be the father. It's not his child, right? He says, take Mary as your wife. She's pregnant with the Son of God. Go marry her. And you will be his adoptive father. And Joseph, we saw that he was Righteous in that he was a man of grace. And secondly, he's a man of obedience because if you drop down to verses 24 and 25, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He does exactly as God instructs him through the angel. And I would include in his obedience his commitment to purity as well because he followed God's rules about sexuality also. And he is an example to young men everywhere about what it means to be a righteously pure man. But without this intervention of this supernatural communication, he would have sent her away. And the message that he is given is just unheard of. It's unlike anything that's ever been said before. And never again will it ever be said. And he trusts in it. And he believes it. This supernatural communication. Look, so can I just say to you this morning, don't look for dreams that are messages 
Don't look for angelic visitations. Follow God's word. It contains his will. It tells us what he wants to know. These supernatural moments are just that. They are supernatural. They are not every day. If they were every day, they would no longer be supernatural. If they were regular and common, they wouldn't be miraculous. They are out of the ordinary on purpose. And so Joseph receives clear communication from an angel about what he should do. Now thirdly, supernatural commission. Supernatural commission. The angel actually isn't done talking, but the angel kind of changes gears in verse 21. She will bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, we all have big aspirations for our children, don't we? We want them to grow up and be good people. We want them to do something positive, to make an impact. And even if your child grows up and solves world hunger, or cures cancer, or develops some life-changing invention, nothing compares to what Jesus will do. Because he has a supernatural commission that he is going to fulfill. He is coming to save people from their sins. This is a supernatural mission that he has. A supernatural task. Jesus did not come to make sure you have a good life. Jesus did not come to make sure you improve your standard of living, to give you a successful career, to give you your best life now. He didn't come for that, so why do people keep talking about that? He came with a much more supernatural and transcendent purpose. It is to save you from your sins. This is about eternal matters, soul matters, the most important matters. If you are saved from your sins, who cares what your life is like? If we have salvation and forgiveness, then we can have the worst of the worst lives, and we'd still have the best. This is why Jesus came. This is a supernatural commission. It's in the very definition of his name. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. It's literally what the name Jesus means. Jehovah saves. This is what he came to do. Even he said, I came to seek and save that which is lost. That's you and I. And it's he himself that does it. You shall call his name Jesus, for he himself will save his people from their sins. He will not send somebody else. He will not farm it out to some other committee. He himself will save you from your sins. This is what the angel says. This is what he's coming. He, he's not coming, Joseph, I want you to know, he's not coming to grant military victory. He's not coming to, to kick the Romans out. He's not coming to make sure you are prosperous in your carpentry business, Joseph. He came to save you. And he's the only one that can do that. To be saved from your sins. What does that tell us about sin? It tells us we all have sin, doesn't it? Everyone. And sin makes us in trouble with God. Because it requires saving And Jesus is the only one who can rescue people from it. I remember telling the gospel to a young man, a teenager, and I said, what will you do when you, who are guilty of sin, stand before a holy God? What will you do? And in his pride, he said with his head up, with his chin up, I will accept my fate. And what I told him was, what if you don't have to? What if you can be forgiven? 
What if you can be saved from your sins? That's why Jesus came, so that you don't have to suffer that fate. And friends, it's very specific, verse 21. He saves his people from their sins. His people. This is particular redemption. He saves his people. Those who are not his people do not have salvation. They do not have salvation from their sins. They are still in their sins. But all of his people, however, chosen from the foundation of the world, they are saved from their sins. And his coming to earth was for this specific commission. To pay for your sins and save your soul so that you are fit for eternal heaven. This is his divine job. And that's why man must turn to him as Savior and Lord. You can find salvation from sins in Christ and Christ alone. Because he has that supernatural commission. And number four, supernatural completion. Supernatural completion. For the first time, as Matthew will do a lot in his gospel, he draws attention to the Old Testament in verse 22. All this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Matthew does this dozens of times in his gospel. And he goes, I want you to see that what Jesus did or what Jesus said fulfills exactly what the Old Testament says. Predictions and passages. And the Old Testament quote is here given in verse 23. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. This comes from the book of Isaiah. This is a quote from the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 7, specifically. And that specific verse is given by the prophet Isaiah to a king. And the king's name is King Ahaz. King Ahaz. He's the king of Judah. And the Bible says he's a wicked king. He was a wicked king. He was the son of Uzziah. But he is the king. And as he is the king, two nations conspire against him to invade and kill him. The king of Samaria and the king of Syria. They join in an alliance to attack Ahaz and wipe him out. They want to kill him and replace him. And such an effort is a satanic-inspired attempt to end the Davidic line. If we kill the Davidic king, then we end the line. And God, in his grace, says through the prophet Isaiah, it's not going to happen. They're not going to win. God would deliver. God will defend. And what God does is he offers King Ahaz a sign. And he says, name your sign, Ahaz. He gives him a blank check. You can ask for whatever you want. There are no limits for me to prove to you that this will be so. I am trustworthy. I am dependent. I will defend you. I will deliver you. Ask for a sign, Ahaz, and I will give it to you. And this wicked king, he says... No. No. Not because he's so humble that he doesn't want to ask God for a sign. He says no because we find out he's already lined up help. He's made an arrangement with the Assyrians. And this wicked king is basically saying, God, I trust them over you. The help that I will receive from Assyria will be stronger and better than your help. And this, of course, makes God angry. And what God says through the prophet, that's the whole context behind this verse. Verse 23, God says, fine, I will give you a sign. You won't ask for a sign, I will give it to you. What is the sign? The virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when God says there in Isaiah 7, I will give you a sign, the you is plural. It's not directed directly at King Ahaz. It is to the nation, Israel as a whole. It is a sign to them that God will defend, God will protect, God will assure the line of David. He will keep his covenant. 
What is this miraculous sign that proves that he will keep his covenant? The virgin will give birth to a son. And this son will be called Emmanuel. The child of the virgin would be someone extraordinary. He would be God with us. So at the same time, he would be a child, a man, a human, and he would also be God. He would be the Son of Man and the Son of God. The divinity and the humanity of Jesus Christ is clearly expressed here. But this kind of prediction and this kind of uh, fulfillment must be of God. This is supernatural because no man could have made sure this come to pass. This is given, Isaiah gives this 700 years before it ever happens. It could never be fulfilled through human efforts. Nobody could make sure that happens. And, and take, for example, itself anyway, a virgin birth could never be accomplished by man in his own way. This is supernatural completion. God is behind this. God is the one making sure this happens. And the supernatural nature of the word of God is seen in verse 22. Look, the Lord spoke through the prophet. Do you see that? God speaks through his writers. This shows us this is God's word. God's word is divine. It is supernatural. This is inspiration. And it's proven to be supernatural because of the specific predictions that are fulfilled. It has to happen this way because God said it would happen this way. And the completion is seen even in the strict obedience of Joseph in verses 24 and 25. He's going to make sure that it is completed as well. Look at what it says in verse 24. Joseph awoke from his sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him, took Mary as his wife. It never says that Joseph is Jesus' father. The Bible is very careful in its details. Jesus is never called Joseph's son. It says Joseph took Mary as his wife and she was pregnant. And this is important because this goes all the way back. We saw it just a few weeks ago in Genesis 3. The promise there in Genesis 3 was that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent. Remember that? The seed of the woman. It's unusual because the seed is usually spoken of as coming from the man. The seed of the man, the seed of the husband, his children. But in Genesis 3, it is the seed of the woman. So the virgin birth is hinted at all the way back in Genesis 3. And notice verse 25, he kept her a virgin until she gave birth to his son, and he called his name Jesus. Listen, it's the virgin that will give birth to his son. It's not that the virgin will conceive. It's not just that the virgin will be pregnant. So he maintains her virginity until Jesus is born. The virgin gives birth. It is so detailed and so specific. But he kept her a virgin, verse 25, until she gave birth to a son. After the fulfillment of the text, after the completion of the prophecy, Joseph and Mary had a normal marriage relationship. They fathered other children naturally. The Gospels even tells us their names. And so the perpetual virginity of Mary, I don't know where that came from. That is not true. And the perpetual virginity of Mary has continued on into other strange and bizarre things like, well, she was immaculately conceived too. No, she was not. And because she was immaculately conceived, and because she remained a perpetual virgin forever, and she was without sin, she also aids in redemption and salvation. No, she does not. She needed a Savior just like everybody else. But Joseph carefully obeys everything, names him Jesus, verse 25, and all of that completes the prediction, the word of God has come true. And God makes sure that his word gets fulfilled. It's fulfilled in the virgin birth of Jesus. And so everything in this passage is supernatural. 
And like we said, it's, it's no wonder that the incarnation, that's what this is, is the most extraordinary miracle in all of human history. God became a man. And the birth of the Messiah is such a monumental moment in all of redemption of history, it has to be something supernatural. But let me tell you here as we close, why this is so important. Why is the virgin birth of Christ so critical to Christian theology and really all of Christianity? Because the Bible talks about sin and the nature of sin as being passed down through the Father. It comes from the Father. It is genetic, if you will. And Romans 5 teaches us this. It comes from the Father. From Adam was the start and all the way down through the line. But because Jesus is not conceived through natural means, he is not of Joseph's genes, right? He avoids the sin nature that is passed down through the Father. He bypasses the curse of sin. And so that confirms Jesus' sinlessness. He is sinless both in his deeds, as others testified about him, and in his nature because it is a miraculous virgin birth. If the virgin birth is not true, then Jesus is born with sin. And if Jesus is born with sin, he cannot save you from your sins. Because he must save himself from his own sins. And so Christ, being the Savior of all mankind, it is the foundation of all of Christianity. And it falls apart without the virgin birth. You have to have the virgin birth. This is why theology is important. This is why Bible study is so critical This is not the birth of anyone. Every single day, 300,000 babies are born over the entire world. No baby has ever come anywhere close to being as unique as Jesus Christ. Because he is the sinless Messiah. He is man and God. He is born supernaturally through the virgin, just as the scripture said he would. Which is why we proclaim Christ being the only way to find salvation. Every other person, religious leader, prophet, doesn't matter. Every other person who's ever been born has been born with the curse of sin. And no one can save you from your sins if they have sin. So the exclusivity of Jesus Christ is absolutely critical. It doesn't mean we're closed-minded. It doesn't mean we're not welcoming to other thoughts. It means we follow the scripture by what it says. And so the virgin virgin birth, it's even an understatement to call it a critical piece of Christian theology. If it's not true, then Jesus can't be the Savior. But he is the Savior. And he came to save us from our sins. And so what our desire is for every person is to say, have you turned to Christ in salvation? You don't have to stand before God and accept your fate. You don't want that. You want Jesus. Sinless Messiah. Son of God and Son of Man. We need to put Christ where he rightly belongs which is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Don't degrade Christ by grouping him in with others. Let's stand as we'll we'll close in prayer.